future because I, there's, I put a couple videos on there that I'm not going to be able to play all the way through, but if you're interested in this stuff, um, you, you might want to check out it. And also, it's, it's pretty scattered, so I apologize for that. It might, might help to go back through it sometime and actually um, be able to think about what I'm saying at one, some point. Um, so, uh, I, f I first learned about the global clean water crisis uh, while I was working on this documentary called Summit on the Summit. And learning the realities of this water crisis was pretty overwhelming at that point. I was brushing my teeth and drinking bottled water, and, and I wasn't even thinking about my consumption of water at all. And trying to spread the word about this crisis, I found out that I, I think I wasn't the only one. You know, that a lot of people aren't really um, considering our, our water use, our energy use. And so to learn, um, to learn, uh, oops, sorry. Thought that might happen. To learn, to learn, uh, to learn some real practical solutions to the water crisis, I came to the Water Studies Institute at NMC, and this is one of the first freshwater studies programs in the nation, and it's and it's cool because we get to go on a lot of field trips. Um, they, they, they might just be, they might be field trips to like the wastewater treatment plant, but even that turns into a, a great learning opportunity for us, and. Um, and, it, and it, it really helped me kind of connect these ideas that we were learning. Throughout the semester, we talked to people in, a, in organizations that are very connected to local water issues. And it's inspiring to see that this community um, really cares about and values our water. And that, that, that community involvement uh, helped me kind of make the water crisis a little less intimidating. And in the classroom, we, we took this local understanding and connected it to global water issues. For instance, Paul Laporte um, came to our class and presented the Rotary Club's efforts in, in distributing um, hydrated biosand filters to provide clean drinking water to those in developing nations. This showed me that there might be uh, simple solutions to the, water, to the water crisis, and all we have to do is know how to look for them. But I, I, you know, I discovered these things in a special program meant to focus on them. So how can we give students in other programs and community members ways to experience things like this so they can be able to uh, recognize, understand, and act on the crisis, whether it be food, water, or energy? Who knows? And I think the first answer is to make Understanding the, the environment, a larger part of our education. Um, David Orr, a professor at Oberlin College, notes that we must recognize that all education is environmental education, and that we're teaching students that, that they are either a part of or apart from natural systems. So we, we should find ways to remind students and community members that, that we are part of a na powerful natural system. Making uh, ecological literacy a staple of our educational programs will start to re-educate society to consider and appreciate our natural resources. In order to deal with the limited resources of the future, we're going to have to do more with less, and we're going to have to change our thought processes. Um, we're going to have to teach students to design with nature in mind, because uh, we won't be able to solve these problems with the same minds that, that created them. And so David Orr proposes that, um, as a start, we can use the college campus itself as a tool for the students. Uh, the college consumes energy and produces waste, and it's a local model that students can, can interact with. Um, so, so this also applies to the community as well, though. What's, what's this building teaching us about energy right now? Are we even thinking, are we even conscious of the energy use of this building when we're walking into it? And so it's, it's, what it's really teaching us is that energy is, is cheap, um, almost free. You know, we don't have to think about it. So, so by seeing and, and studying electricity and water use, we can uh, become more familiar with these often ignored resources. Um, a, mu a multidisciplinary environmental and liberal arts education gives students the power and experience to recognize our energy systems for optimal efficiency. With these goals in mind, um, Dr. Orr led a group of students and community members to develop uh, a sustainable interactive building called the Lewis Center for Environmental Studies at Oberlin College. They've just celebrated their 10-year anniversary and continue to foster creative thinking in their students. And so to learn more about this building's technology and to borrow uh, some of these ideas for Traverse City, I hoped, I, I recruited a group of students to go on a discovery expedition um, to 
to Oberlin, to Northern Ohio. And the, group, the trip was made possible by a student innovation grant from the NMC Foundation, and thanks to the support of my advisors, Constanza Hazelwood and Hans von Sumren. And this is, uh, this is Constanza actually driving us down in this huge rental van. Uh, she, she, had to, she had to grip that wheel white knuckled the entire way because we, the, we were just buffeted with crosswinds on 75 there. But we made it. We, we, we met with the Environmental Studies Department head, John Peterson, and um, toured the Lewis Center. Uh, I'm going to highlight a couple of the most interesting features, but this video has a full tour if you, if you want to go through it. And, and to thank Oberlin um, for sharing these ideas with us, we gave them clones of the state champion Black Willows from the Grand Traverse Commons property. Um, b besides being a, a representation of TC, Willows are excellent at natural water treatment. So it was a special way to connect our two very similar water conscious towns. So thank you, Arch Archangel. Um, so here are some of the innovations at Oberlin that um, integrate natural systems, human systems, and building systems for learning. Let's start with a process that's, that's pretty close and private to us. Our, our current wastewater system is aptly named. It's, it's an extremely wasteful process. We're treating, drinking, we're treating water to drinking water standards, uh, pumping it in to, into our house, crapping in it, and then shoveling it away for another energy intensive round of treatment. On top of that, it teaches us to ignore that in nature, um, what we consider uh, waste is actually a valuable resource. It's a fertilizer that feeds the cycle and fosters growth and production. So how could we begin to, um, how could we begin to so solve problems like the fact that 90% of wastewater in developing countries is dumped untreated directly into receiving waters? When our cultural pers perspective on, on wastewater is, is um, flesh and bone. With Kohler's powerful high-efficiency toilets, flush and done. So, so when it's out of sight, out of mind like that, how, how, how can we take a new approach to wastewater process? Um, I'm sure a couple of new parents in the audience might be saying that uh, wastewater, waste pro the waste process is visible enough. But um, the Lewis Center demystifies this process by using a, what's called a living machine or eco-machine. And what that is, it's a, it's a system developed by John Todd, which treats wastewater by circulating it through plants, roots, and bacteria in a greenhouse-based constructed wetland system. It's an, it's an eye-opening reminder for anyone that uses the Lewis Center restroom that if we look closely at nature's systems, there are other more sustainable methods for water treatment and reuse. Plus, the facility is a living classroom. It's maintained and monitoring by, monitored by students. Um, so in, in this video, uh, the, there's a living machine actually in Vermont at a rest stop that treats all the wastewater there. And so imagine uh, the impact of something like this, that, that, that if we built something like this in um, a public restroom downtown, how Traverse City could uh, invite tourists to enjoy our beaches and at the same time change their perceptions on water use. Um, the building also features some simple ideas uh, that bring nature and sustainability into the campus. Uh, the main gathering space had a watering water fountain that was um, designed by students. And it was powered by a solar, solar panel right outside the window. So it was kind of a reminder that that solar energy was always, was always coming. And um, when, when, when it was sunny out, the, f the, the fountain would flow rapidly. When it got overcast, it would slow to a trickle. And that's the problem with. Uh, energy is that you can't really see it. You can't, you know, it's, it's invisible. So, so how do you quantify it? Um, another innovative thing at Oberlin uh, is that they're, they, they developed a, an energy orb project. And an energy orb is a colored light about the size of a cantaloupe that changes color to indicate the total energy use of the building. These ambient reminders are installed by main entrances on the on several college buildings and dorms, and, and the students are actually um, expanding the project into the town. So how would, how would your employees or coworkers be impacted if they saw how much energy the office was using even as they were walking out the door um, at, at the, after work? Um, paired with these energy orbs is, is dashboard software, which uses remote monitors to show water use, electricity use, and solar generation for buildings on campus and soon in some parts of the town. This allows anyone to track usage, see system patterns and weaknesses, or celebrate progress. By making this info understandable on the website, 
um, they, they, they're making reducing energy consumption a team effort. And to, to, to really make it a team effort, they, um, they even have contests between, between dorms that, uh, that, that they've seen some really immediate and la lasting changes in behavior. Uh, Dr. Peterson talked about it. They never the once put energy about on. the vending machine and its energy consumption. And suddenly, it's like they're walking around, and it's almost as though you put new glasses on them, and they're seeing energy everywhere. They're looking at this energy, and it's like, oh my god, that vending machine, it's a parasite. It's sucking energy <laughs> out of our territory. You know, I won't tolerate that. So, so what if we as communities uh, put on energy goggles? Would you see, um, for instance, your old, old water heater as some kind of prehistoric energy carnivore? By, by, by bringing remote monitoring to Traverse City, we can start to see energy and water use and start dialogues about how we can begin to conserve them. Ambient reminders like um, the living machine and energy orbs teach everyone at a basic level to be more aware and understanding of our resource flows. With a, with a multidisciplinary education that incorporates ecological liter literacy, we can prepare for a future where we may be confronted with uh, limited resources. Ecological design using the campus and community buildings as models will teach students to adapt and invent creative solutions for future sustainability issues. Thank you.